All right, uh, we're going to go ahead and get started today. Um, Tim O'Day told me that if less than 10 people showed up, I should probably talk about um, croquet strategy and um, different shots and things of that nature. But uh, fortunately for you all, uh, more than 10 people did show up. So uh, we'll go ahead with the lesson. But today I want to spend some time talking about uh, the idea of priesthood of all believers and how that relates to vocation. Um, so let's start by reading uh, two passages of Scripture. We're going to read from Exodus and 1 Peter. And in honor of uh, the priesthood of all believers and how we minister together and help one another out, buddy up and one get the Old Testament passage and one get the New Testament passage, and um, we'll, we'll go from there. But Exodus 19, we'll start in verse 4. And that joke will be a lot more funny as yet we actually understand what the priesthood of all believers really is. And if not, don't tell me that it wasn't. All right, Exodus 19, verse 4. You yourselves have seen what I did to the Egyptians and how I bore you on eagles' wings and brought you to myself. Now, therefore, if you will indeed obey my voice and keep my covenant, you shall be my treasured possession among all peoples. For all the earth is mine, and you shall be to me a kingdom of priests and a holy nation. These are the words that you shall speak to the people of Israel. All right, now let's look at 1 Peter 2 and verse 4, and you can just listen if you'd like. And try to note some of the similarities here. As you come to him, a living stone rejected by men, but in the sight of God, chosen and precious, you yourselves, like living stones, are being built up as a spiritual house to be a holy priesthood, to offer spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God through Jesus Christ. And then skipping to verse 9. But you are a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people for his own possession, that you may proclaim the excellencies of him who called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. Once you were not a people, but now you are God's people. Once you had not received mercy, but now you have received mercy. Let's pray. Uh, Father, we thank you that um, by your blood you have made us priests. We thank you that you have chosen to use us to manifest your glory to the nations. So I pray as we hear this, pass this uh, teaching today and this passages that we apply them to our hearts and realize that we are all needed and important in bringing your glory to the nations. You've chosen to do this through people. So encourage us and edify us through your word. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Um, oftentimes, um, we elevate our pastors, our missionaries, um, maybe even our theologians to a status uh, that is very lofty. Um, and it is good and right to honor these men. These men uh, teach us. They, they uh, labor diligently for our souls. They share the gospel with non-believing peoples. And we are right and good to honor these men. But oftentimes, we lift them up a little too high. So what happens is, we start to look at them and we despair. Now why do we despair? We despair because I see my pastor teaching so well and I think, I can never know my Bible as well as he does. I can never share the gospel as well as he does. I'll never be as good as X, Y, and Z. He's the one that can do it. So what happens? Um, I think two things oftentimes happen. We look at their, these men and we say, God can only use a handful of individuals. He can only use these few select chosen ones to bring about his glory to the nations. So I stop trying to share the gospel with my friends. Why? Because I'll mess it up. I'm not good at doing this. So I say, just come to church, just come to church, or read this book, or here's a sermon, and we relegate it to a handful of men. And what we do is we look at these gifts, or we look at their gifts and their abilities and these people, and we judge our usefulness on, based on what they do and on their gifts. So I'm only useful insofar as I can do these things which when we look at it, it's a handful of things. Teach well, um, be knowledgeable, um, or whatever. It's a handful of things we say. If I'm useful, I have to do these things well, and I don't. So I'm not the one to bring God's glory to the nations. Um, oftentimes, also, we think, if I want to be useful, I'll develop these gifts. So we spend our lives uh, pursuing these handful of things. And we may feel gifted in a certain way. It's like, well, I'm, I'm good at encouraging, but who wants to be good at encouraging? When I could be proclaiming the gospel boldly 
when I could be writing these uh, very in-depth theological um, treaties that engage the culture. Who wants to be an encourager? So I chase after these gifts and these talents, and I pursue those, and I neglect what God has gifted me with. I neglect the body, I think, like the Corinthians, who valued certain gifts over others, right? To the neglect of their brothers and their own gifting. We must steer clear of this type of thinking because we, when we do this, when we think like this, that it's only a handful of gifts and individuals that bring God's glory to the nations, we have ignored the teachings of the whole Bible. God has always chosen a people, a group of people, a community, to bring His glory to the nations. And they are not all the same. They're uniquely gifted. And they're uniquely talented. They have different desires. They have different hobbies. They have different interests. And they live in different stations of life. And I think this is why it is so important that we understand the teaching of priesthood of all believers. The priesthood of all believers says that all believers are equal in status before God. You don't have these handful of individuals who are sacred and set apart before God for His use, but rather we are all set apart for God's use. We are all to engage in making Christ known to the nations. And also the idea of vocation, I think, is in tandem with this. Because if we are all to make God's glory known to the nations by our gifts and our talents and our abilities, then where do we do this? Do we all forsake our jobs? Do we forsake our families? Do we um, trade our hobbies in for other hobbies and interests, like just reading theology, which can be pretty boring. So if you had a a better hobby, you might want to pursue that. But um, do we trade those in? Do we forget these things? Do we forget who we are in some sense? No, we don't. We serve God in those stations, in those vocations, in those callings. And we fulfill them differently. Um, I was going to spend some time talking about Martin Luther. He's really the one that kind of hammered this teaching out. He at least popularized it anyway. Uh, but you can find it in uh, John Huss and um, Wycliffe. And, you know, Wycliffe is saying that we need to get the Scriptures to the people. Why? Because we can all read the Scriptures and know the Scriptures, um, not just a handful of people. Um, But Luther is essentially reacting, I'll just kind of summarize really quickly. He's reacting against uh, the Roman church's teaching that there are those who are sacred or set apart, which would be the the clergy, you know, the priests, the bishops, that type of idea. And then you had everybody else. Um, And what essentially happens is these men become mediators um, between God and the laity, the average member of the congregation. If you want many things, you have to go through them. And he says, no, no, it's not just you who manifest God's good gifts to the world and to the people, but we all can do this. We all have a part in the community to edify one another and also outside of the community toward the world. Um, so he's reacting against that, and he's not necessarily reacting against the priestly structure as much as the abuses of it. And he's going against uh, his, when he argues against their view of the Lord's Supper, and he comes up with his um, the idea of consubstantiation against that. That's really going against... This is abusing your power. You have put yourself as a mediator here and say only the priests can offer this up. If, and, only, and only the priests are the ones appointed by the Pope. So the church controls all these things. And he's really going against that um, with his idea of consubstantiation. But we won't uh, get too in-depth to that. Um, <clears throat> but where was Luther finding this? Is he just making these ideas up? Is he just upset at the church and says, uh, well, we're all priests, not just a handful of people. We're all priests. No, um, I would uh, submit that he is getting this from the Bible. And he is getting this not just from a handful of passages, but I think he's also getting it from the whole trajectory and scope of the Bible as it progresses in Revelation. So let's look at a few passages. And I want to start in that passage in Exodus first, and we'll kind of uh, see where this is coming from the Scriptures. So back in Exodus 19, 4 through 6, I won't read it again, but I'll kind of summarize it and you can follow along. So we find in this passage at the very beginning of a section of Scripture where God is getting ready to enter into covenant with the nation of Israel. Um, And this is kind of like in some ways the preamble to that. He reminds them of his salvation or of their salvation. He brought them up out of Egypt like on eagles' wings. It was miraculous. He showed his power by bringing them out of the hands of the Egyptians. 
And then he, we see a conditional statement that says, If you will indeed obey my voice and keep my covenant. And then it's followed by three promises, or if you do these things, then this will happen. And we see those. You will be a treasured possession among all the nations. You'll be a kingdom of priests and a holy nation. And we also see reminders that all the earth is mine. And I think if you were to see the Great Commission and be like, that kind of sounds like that. I think there are some overtones here. Uh, all authority on earth and on heaven has been given to me. Um, and go, therefore, and do, um, make disciples of all nations. But what does this mean for Israel? What is their identity to be? What are they to be about? Are they all to be priests <clears throat> in the sense that, well, we all are going to be uh, working in the temple now. Um, we're going to be uh, struggling to get food now because we have no farmers and uh, we have no bakers and et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Well, it's going to be a, a tough life all working in the temple because we have no ways to provide for ourselves. Well, no, of course not. Um, this is actually before the formal priesthood was even established that he calls them a kingdom of priests. Now, the, the idea of priests would have been familiar, familiar to them. They've uh, been in Egypt where there were priests to the gods there, and Moses in some ways uh, functions in a uh, priestly role in some ways as well. But what does this mean for them? And I think very simply, we'll just kind of boil it down, they are going to be set aside, holy. They're going to be set apart as a treasured possession of God among the nations, and they will be manifesting God's glory to all the nations as they worship and serve God. And then he's going to tell them how to do that in the next few chapters as he sets out his covenant and his law with them. Obey my voice, do these things, and they will know that I am God, and they will see um, my glory by the way that you worship and the way that you serve me. So they are to, in some ways, be a city set on a hill, they are to be a light to the nations. But we must remember the conditional phrase there, if you indeed hear my voice and obey my, command, or my covenant. So to, to the degree to which they fulfill that, to which they are obedient and obey God and serve God and love God, they will manifest His glory to the nations. But what happens if they don't? What happens if they fail? Well, we find out even before Moses gets down off the mountain, they fail, don't they? Moses is up on the mountain getting ready to hear the covenant that God is going to make and he's going to bring it back to the people. And what does he find when he gets down at the bottom? They're already worshiping an idol. They're already worshiping the golden calf. So what happens to them? Um, they become a laughingstock among the nations. Exodus 32, 25 said, And when Moses saw that the people had broken loose, for Aaron had let them break loose, to the derision of their enemies. It just means they became a laughingstock among their enemies. They were supposed to be a special people, set apart, but now they're just like everyone else. They are nothing. And the nations look upon that and laugh and they dishonor God's name. But God is patient and He is kind and He's slow to wrath and He bears with the people. He gives them the sacrificial system, which is to allow them to be able to dwell with a holy God um, and in the midst of their sin so they can uh, offer sacrifices for their sins and continue to live with Him. Uh, in fellowship. And they are to continue manifesting His glory as priest. But <clears throat> we know far too often they failed in this, didn't they? They did not honor God. Uh, they served other gods. They worshiped other gods. And uh, they did not know God, many of them. Now, is this something new in the Bible, this passage in Exodus, this idea of kingdom of priest? Or has the idea of priest always been there? And is it continuing? And I would argue that, yes, this has been the plan from the very beginning, that God would manifest His glory through a people. He would take these people and, and let them shine forth His glory to the nations. We see this from the very beginning. So we have Adam in the garden. God creates him. He places him in the garden. He commands him to uh, fill the earth and subdue it, right? And the idea here is that God will dwell with man in the garden, and as man fulfills this, as he fills the earth, and as he uh, subdues it, the garden will in some way grow to spread over the rest of the earth. And God's glory will fill the earth. But sadly, we know that um, man is tempted and he sins. He gives in, and sin enters into the world. But in, in through the midst of all this sin, chaos, God gives a promise, doesn't he? He says that, one of the offspring of the woman's children will crush the serpent's head. 
So there from the very beginning we have a promise that there will be one who comes after. But guess what? Cain kills Abel. And then Abel, or Cain wanders away. So it looks like the promise is already done, right? That didn't take long. But no, God gives them another son and gives them Seth. And Seth's family begins to call upon the Lord. They begin to worship the Lord. And then from Seth comes eventually Noah. Now God enters into covenant with Noah. Um, he destroys all of mankind, but he sees Noah and that Noah is a holy man, that Noah loves the Lord. So he covenants with him, destroys everything on the earth by the flood, but saves Noah and his family. So hum the humanity is preserved through Noah, through his relationship with God. <clears throat> and also creation is stabilized. He makes a promise that he will never destroy the earth by water again. So the creation is stabilized. Blessings flow from Noah to the world. Humanity is, uh, has a new start in some sense, and the creation is stabilized. Um, <clears throat> but guess what? Noah, too, fails. He fails to be a priest to the nations. He, just like Adam and Eve, were found naked and ashamed. He is found uh, naked before his sons, and uh, he, too, partook of the fruit of the vine a little too much, um, just like Adam and Eve took and ate from the fruit of the tree. So again, they've messed up, they've failed. Uh, but God's purpose of taking a people still continues uh, to act as priest. We see Abraham. He's descended from who? From Noah. It's the same line throughout history. Um, the same line, the blessings will flow to the nations. God promises what? He said, I'll make you a great nation. I will uh, bless you and I will protect you. Now, he's not just blessing him for Abraham's sake alone, right? It's not just like, things will be, go well for you, good. No, he says, I will bless you so that you will bless others. And as Abraham's story progresses, we get to Genesis 22, and we see um, that specifically these blessings will come through a single offspring, right? Um, we see all the, nation, all the families on the earth will be blessed, and then we also see that one, and it's singular here, offspring will bless the nations through him. So there's that promise of that one individual. But then from Abraham, of course, we get the people of Israel, and we won't, um, we'll jump ahead back to Exodus um, 19, but the story progresses. They go into Egypt, right? And then uh, God brings them out, and we see that um, this individual will come from where? The tribe of Judah. So it's getting more specific and more specific. Um, but anyway, we get to Exodus 19. We have a whole people now. We went from a handful of individuals to a whole people. God's created a people. And he tells them, you will be my priest to the nations. The same idea. You worship me. You serve me. And blessings will go to the nations. It is not for your sake alone. But it's for the sake of my name and for all the nations. But yet, as we've already said, they fail to. Even before Moses can get down from the mountain. God's people, if we were to go from Exodus 19 all the way up into the New Testament, God's people have been continual failures in their priestly role. They've continually not spoken truly of God with their lives. They have given in to false idol worship. The very people of God, now don't miss this, began to bow down to idols of other gods and worship them. They were a mixed community. Some knew God, some didn't. They even with the sacrificial system that was given to them as means to be in communion with the Lord, they didn't do it with a contrite heart. They just went through the motions to say. They didn't see this as their worship towards God, but it's just something that we have to do. And we know that they um, extorted you know, people in their community. Um, they were not honest at times. They treated the widow and the orphan poorly. And this is all speaking to the nations. Don't miss this. This is speaking to the nations the way they live their lives. And it's saying, God is like this. And so God acts, right? He's jealous to protect his name. We see that often in the Bible. For the sake of my name, I acted. For the sake of my name, I did this. So eventually he punishes them and sends them into exile. So all throughout the Old Testament, we are left with a taste in our mouth like, there must be something more. There must be something better. And praise God, there is something better. There is something more. We cling to the promise in the old, promises in the Old Testament. If we read our Old Testament carefully, that there will be one from the woman's offspring who will crush the serpent's head. 
that will bring blessing to all the nations, that will um, <clears throat> be from the tribe of Judah and from David's line. And God has established David's line eternally. It's a covenant that will not pass away. So we see something new here happening. And the prophets uh, like Jeremiah tell us of this. And we see in Jeremiah 31 and uh, verse 31 through 34, Behold, the days are coming, declares the Lord, when I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and the house of Judah, not like the covenant I made with their fathers on the day when I took them by the hand to bring them out of the land of Egypt, back to Exodus 19. My covenant that they broke, though I was their husband, declares the Lord. But this is the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel after those days, declares the Lord. I will put my law within them, and I will write it on their hearts, and I will be their God, and they shall be my people. And no longer shall each one teach his neighbor and each his brother, saying, Know the Lord, for they shall all know me, from the least of them to the greatest, declares the Lord. For I will forgive their iniquity, and I will remember their sin no more. So as we read the Old Testament, this is our hope that something new is going to happen. So now when we get to 1 Peter and we see this passage, it sounds very much like what? Exodus 19, doesn't it? We see in 1 Peter chapter 2, and we'll look at verse 9. He says, You are a chosen race, a race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people for his own possession, that you may proclaim the excellencies of him who called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. We see these same three titles that were, applied, that were said to the congregation in Israel now applied to the church. Treasured possession, royal priesthood, and a holy nation. So is this the same thing, or is there something different here? And I would argue that it is both. The same priestly function that we have seen from the beginning of the Old Testament up until this point is the same. God's people, through their lives, will proclaim the majesties and glories of God to the nations as they serve and worship Him. So it's the same thing in that sense, but now it's given to the church or God's people. <clears throat> but it's different in several senses, I think. We noted again that God's people had failed continuously. Uh, they were a mixed body. Um, they, some knew the Lord, some didn't. So when we hear that um, passage in Jeremiah that all will know the Lord, he's saying you will no longer be a mixed body, but all will be indwelt with the Spirit. I will forgive their sins, and they shall know me. So what's different here? Several things. Christ has obeyed perfectly. Remember Israel? That conditional statement at the beginning of Exodus 19, if you do these things, they failed, right? They broke the covenant, Jeremiah told us. Well, now one has come, that same one that was foretold in the Old Testament. He has come and obeyed perfectly. He's fulfilled all righteousness. And now he alone has perfectly mediated God's glory to the nations. He was the faithful son, the faithful priest. We were not. We could not be. Christ has made a once-for-all sacrifice for sins. No longer do God's people have to make sacrifices for their sins continually, but Christ has done that once and for all in His body. He has given Himself up as the, he, the high priest gave Himself up. And now we are free to love our neighbor. We are free from condemnation. I no longer have to worry about myself in that regard anymore, but I can look toward those outside of me and love my brother and love my neighbor. And through Christ, all the nations have been blessed. We, we see this one people bringing about God's reconciliation of the whole world. But what happens when they're cast into exile? Did he scrap his project? Did he punt? No. He sent them into exile. And we, we hear later, he says, is it too hard of a thing for me to bring my people back from all over the world? No, it's not. And he didn't speak of Israel, the geopolitical country. He spoke of the true Israel those heart-circumcised worshipers of God. He is gathering them now from all corners of the earth and bringing them to Himself. All the nations have been blessed. Abra the promises to Abraham have been fulfilled. And then Christ has created His own nation of priests, and He has indwelt them by the Spirit. We read in Revelation 5, 9-10, through 10, Worthy are you to take the scroll and to open its seals, for you were slain, and by your blood, you ransomed people from, 
for, for God from every tribe, language, people, and nation. And you have made them a kingdom and priests to our God, and they shall reign on the earth. So by his blood, he has done these things. By his life, he has done these things. He has created his own kingdom of priests who now are no longer a mixed body where some know the Lord and some don't, but they all know the Lord. And now they aren't left to their own devices, but they have been indwelt with the Spirit. He will convict them of sin. He will turn their hearts. These priests now are enabled to do the very thing they were created to do, to manifest God's glory to the nations. He tells them how to do that in His law. So Christ mediates a new law to us. But He doesn't say, good luck, I hope you can do it. He gives us the Spirit to do these things and make us holy over time. Well, hopefully we've established that this has been God's plan from the beginning, that we are priests as God's people to make known His glories to the nations by the way we live our lives. But what does this mean for us today? Why is this important that we know these things? I think it is important for several reasons, and I've got three here that we'll walk through. But first, we make Christ known to the nations by giving our entire lives, not just duration of life, but the entirety of our being. So our, our entire lives as spiritual sacrifices to God. <clears throat> now we see this idea picked up in 1 Peter 2. If you go to verse 5, it says, You yourselves, like living stones, are being built up as a spiritual house to be a holy priesthood to offer spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God and through Jesus Christ. Paul also, in Romans 12, picks the same idea up. He says, I appeal to you, therefore, brothers, by the mercies of God, to present your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God, which is your spiritual worship. So as in the Old Covenant, the primary mode of worship to God was sacrifice. You would sacrifice animals to God. This was the primary way they worshiped. Now, it's still the same as far as sacrifice is the primary way we worship Him. But who the sacrifice is now has changed. It's us. Our lives are to be given to this. We are to use our lives as sacrifices, as living sacrifices to God. Now, great, what does that mean? <laughs> That's a, a neat idea, sure. But what does that mean practically? What does that look like? What are these mysterious living and spiritual sacrifices? Well, I think often we think about living Christianly or living uh, as a Christian before the world, we sometimes relegate that just a handful of practices, don't we? Well, I will be faithful to read the Word. I will pray. Um, I will attend church. Um, I may even read my Bible at, on my break at work. And by these things, the world will know that I am Christ. Sure, these things do help in that. But I think it's more than just a few religious practices. I think it's everything we are. Our whole ethic changes. If you look at those uh, two passages we mentioned in 1 Peter and then in Romans 12, what follows after that? What follows is, and especially with 1 Peter you see this, is Christ telling them, okay, you're to be spiritual sacrifices. Why? So you'll proclaim my glories to the nations. And then he gets very practical. Submit to the authorities. Um, don't try to seek to be free, but submit to your masters and glorify them where you're at. Um, he tells them uh, to do several things. And um, in Romans 12, he talks about loving the body. How do we live within the context of cr the Christian body? And then he also talks about, again, submitting to authorities and living this out everywhere. So what has happened is that this has radically changed who we are. It's not just a few external practices, but everything I am has changed. And I don't go just do a few practices, but I go into my station of life or my vocation, and I live this out. It's something radically different. So what has happened? Well, the easy answer is Christ has changed our hearts. What does this mean? Before we came to know Christ, I think we see this throughout the Bible as well, man is in some ways turned in on himself. He is self-centered. He seeks after his own glory, not after God's glory, and not after the good of other men. Now, he sometimes may do good acts, sure, but these are not done before God, and they are as filthy rags. So he's turned in on himself. But when Christ speaks the gospel to my heart, it transforms my heart so that it is no longer focused in on itself, but it in some ways turns it inside out so that now I live towards Christ and also toward those outside of me. So we have changed radically. Our orientation has changed. I live toward Christ and toward my brother. 
So everything I do is now done to the Lord. Now, why is it done to the Lord? Well, I do it, I think, because of thanksgiving, because I realize I would not be where I'm at in be, unless, I'm um, sorry, I would not be where I'm at if it were not for what Christ has done. If he would not have changed me, I would not be where I'm at. That's why I obey him out of gratitude. And I also am able to obey because he has given me the spirit. So everything that I'm doing, God is enabling me to do. He's changed my heart. And now he says, do these things, obey me, honor me. And he gives me the spirit to do them. And I do them to glorify Christ and to honor him. But also I am free to love my neighbor now. I no longer am concerned about my sin. I am no longer solely concerned with my good, but now Christ has changed my heart in such a way that I love those outside of me. We read in Matthew 25, uh, 31 and following, um, Christ is talking about the last judgment, and he has two groups. He has goats and sheep. And if you remember, he divides them, and the, the goats are cast into hell. Why? Because they never serve Christ. But they're like, whoa, whoa, whoa. We did. We gave you water while you were in prison. We clothed you. We, we did all these things. We gave you food while you were hungry. But he says, no, you did not. Why? Because you didn't do it to the least one of these brothers or other Christians. And then the sheep are accepted. And they're astonished that they're accepted because they said, we never saw you hungry, thirsty, and helped you out. And he said, yes, you did. Because you did it to the least one of these brothers. So just within the context of the Christian church, as I see my brother and sister in need and I minister to them, I am serving Christ. I am ministering to that person outside of myself as Christ, as a little Christ in some ways. And this glorifies and honors the Lord. So I'm able now to focus not just on myself, but on Christ and on those outside of me. And this also extends, I think, to the world. And that passage is specifically talking about Christian brothers um, and sisters. But I think this is the way our life is oriented outside the church as well. We serve those. We see those in need and we want to help them. Why? Because we don't have to worry about ourselves anymore. Christ has accomplished everything we need. We have hope stored up in heaven. We can give our lives, literally, because we have hope that awaits us. So we can love our brothers. And when we do these two things, we see in 1 Peter 2, 11 through 12, that this shows the world God's glory. Beloved, I urge you as sojourners and exiles to abstain from the passions of the flesh, which wage war against your soul. Keep your conduct among the Gentiles honorable, so that when they speak against you as evildoers, they may see your good deeds and glorify God on the day of visitation. And also Matthew 5, 16 tells us to um, that do our works before men. Let our light shine so before men that they'll see our good works and do what? Glorify our Father in heaven. So we live this way so that those outside may know who Christ is. They may know his glories. So how do we live these principles out? We see that my life has just changed. It's not a few handful of religious practices, but it's changed radically who I am. My conduct, everything has changed. And my orientation is now toward Christ and my brother. So how do I live this out? Do we all become missionaries and pastors and theologians? No. Some may, and that is fine. But we are to live this out right where we are, in our context, in our station of life. Paul in 1 Corinthians 7 um, talks about um, living as you were called. He says, if you're a slave, don't seek to be free just because Christ has saved you. Honor him right where you're at. So, and then he also uses the example of two unbelievers, one that are married, one uh, becomes a Christian, the other doesn't. He doesn't say, don't see, he says, don't leave him or her, but honor Christ right there in that station of life where you're at, where your calling is. Honor him right there. Now, that doesn't mean that at time our calling won't change, but where we're at, we honor Christ with whatever we have been called to do. This is our vocation. So we must recognize, secondly, the importance of vocation. Now, what do we typically think of when we think of vocation? We think of my job. Um, I'm a bank teller, I'm an um, insurance agent, I'm a school teacher. Um, but vocation, I think, encompasses so much more. Because there's, I think there's nothing more dehumanizing uh, than to be relegated just to a vocation. So, for instance, if, when I'm at home or somewhere and somebody asks me, what do I do or what do I want to do? 
uh, and I say, well, I'd like to be a pastor someday. And then all for the next 20 years that we can talk about is being a pastor or the Bible, which is good in a lot of ways, but it's just like, I'm just this one thing. And I want to say, no, I'm so much more than that. So right now, just dissecting me in several ways, what, what am I? Well, I'm an intern. Um, <laughs> I serve in that way. You know, and I, I want to be a pastor. I have those desires, so I'm pursuing that. Um, I'm also a husband. And if we were expecting this to be a great time to say, and now um, I'm about to be a father, but we're not. So, um, <laughs> But hopefully one day I will be a father and fulfill that station in life. Um, let's see, I, I'm a dog owner. Um, I have several hobbies. Um, and I take my dog owning uh, seriously, too. So. <laughs> so I am so many different things. I'm not just a job. I'm not just a vocation in that sense. But my vocation encompasses my whole life. And when Christ saves me, when he changes my heart, I don't go do these different handful of religious practices. I fulfill these things right where I'm at. As a husband, I seek to love my wife differently. And I think it's hard for us to see sometimes because we live in a Christian culture. And, and um, the culture at, a lot of, in, at large maybe adapts a lot of Christian practices. They have borrowed capital. Um, they use our ideas in a lot of ways. But if we were to be in a totally pagan context, I think this would be a little more explicit. But... You know, we love our wives differently. So I treat my dog differently. I, um, <clears throat> at my job as an intern, I try to love my brothers differently. When I'm out in the world, um, if I had kids, when I go to my, uh, take my kids to soccer practice, I live differently there everywhere. It changes radically everything. I am taken and put in these contexts, and I glorify God there in my vocation. So, and I think the main reason I wanted to teach this lesson is because oftentimes the average person in the church or the person that's not the pastor or doesn't have pastoral aspirations or is a missionary often sometimes feels as if what they do is not important. My being a mother, my being a school teacher, my being an accountant in an office by myself where I see nobody, these things aren't important. I'm not able to glorify the Lord. And everything within me wants to cry out and say, that is not true. That is not true at all. God has saved you. He has changed you with all your desires, interests, hobbies, vocate, all these things. And he says, honor me, glorify me right here. And you doing this shows the nations my glory. You're being faithful. You're fulfilling the great commission right where you're at. And this gives us a whole new purpose, doesn't it? Because now I know that doing my job is important because I'm glorifying God. I know that changing the 15th diaper or spending hour upon hour disciplining the kids when they will not listen is important because I am glorifying God through these things. I am being a priest and the world looks at these things and they know who Christ is. They see these things. Now, oftentimes when we talk about fulfilling the Great Commission and uh, maybe even acting as priest, we, we just make it just personal evangelism, vocally speaking the gospel. Uh, so you have this distinction sometimes between we need to live it out and also speak it. And I, I hate trying to divide those sometimes. I just, just do both. But oftentimes we make this one so much more important than the other one. And so the, the person that is not able to have those places to be able to share like that is often seen as unimportant. I'm not able to, to share the gospel like this. Because I'm an accountant in the office by myself and they actually don't let me out. I have to stay in here. So they feel unimportant. But no, we need to do what Christ has called us to do in that station, to glorify and honor Him wherever we are at. And this, in some ways, makes Christ known to the nations. This, in some ways, fulfills the reconciliation of Christ to that individual or to that group of people. Now, we do, yes. If we just did that and never spoke the gospel, you know, then they would not know Christ. We have to do that too. But... Know that doing your job, parenting well, loving your spouse well, um, going, if you have some kind of crazy hobby, let's, let's say you like a renaissance fairs and you go dress up as a medieval jester or something, and you do that to the glory of God there, you're making Christ known and fulfilling that in some ways. So let's do these together. Let's share our faith vocally, but let's also do this and know that it, it in some ways is bringing them to Christ. Um, oftentimes I think we, we feel like Sharing Christ has to be a home run hit. So I meet an individual 
and I share the gospel, for it to be a success, he's got to right there fall on his knees and profess faith in Christ. But we also know that that is not our own personal experience. It took many years for many of us to come to Christ. Many of us saw somebody, a marriage, and that led us to Christ. We may not know why, but there's something different there. Why do they live like this? And I think Peter gets at this in 1 Peter. You live this way among the nations so that when they come to you and ask for reason for the hope within you, you'll be ready to give a defense. And you'll proclaim the glories and the majesties of Christ to them. So it is both our life and our deeds, but I'm sorry, our word and our deeds, but do it right where you're at. Don't feel like you have to go leave becoming, leave your family and become a pastor to do that. You can do it right there. Now, God, as I said, may call you some to be that, and that's fine. And your vocation has changed in that regard. But the encouraging thing, because we all know that we struggle with sin and that we oftentimes fail to properly manifest Christ. We are lazy on our jobs or we get snappy with our brothers at work or friends at work. Um, the good thing to remember is that we are secure in Christ. There's no condemnation for us. And that Christ has given us the spirit to do these things. He's given us grace to be able to do this now so that we can fulfill this mandate. Um, so every one of us in the church are important to making God's name known to the nations in his redemptive purposes. So if we're all important, we're all doing this, I think we must remember that it is not a solo project. Uh, this teaching, the priesthood of all believers, has oftentimes been um, perverted and made into the priesthood of the believer, singular. And what they say is, I don't need the church. Why? Because I can go right to God. I don't need these other people. I don't need history in the, the church history. I, it's me and God. Uh, I will serve him here. But we have missed that every time that the idea of kingdom of priest has been mentioned, it's been done where? In the context of a community. They together will glorify God to the nations. We must also remember that we are all different. We've all been gifted or created differently, first of all, given different interests and talents and abilities. But we've also been gifted differently by the Spirit. And we shouldn't elevate certain gifts above others to say that, to the point where we say these aren't important, but only these two or three gifts are. No, they are all important because without them, the body doesn't function properly. The Corinthians had a terrible time understanding this, didn't they? They elevated certain gifts to the exclusion of others and even grew in contempt toward their brothers and maybe even their own gifts because God has not properly gifted me to be able to manifest him to the nations. That's just not the case. He had given that gift because he knew they needed it. Their body of believers needed them and that gift. We all need one another. Um, <clears throat> in the new members curriculum, Lee has a sermon uh, from Ephesians. And it, um, the example from there is, so one is gifted to teach. So he teaches, and the one that is gifted in prayer now is better instructed in how to pray. So now he prays for the one who teaches, and the one who teaches becomes a better teacher. So they, by their gifts, are building one another up. And that's the idea here. We're building one another up to do this, to better manifest God's glory to the nations. And we can't forget that one of the primary ways that the world will know that we are Christians is by how we love one another. We can't neglect all the one another passages in the Bible. Love one another, bear with one another, and etc. Pray for one another. So the clear message from the Bible is that a community of priests will manifest God's glory to the nations. And we fulfill the Great Commission in our stations of life as God has called us. And He may call some to go to foreign countries and fulfill that vocation, and that is great. But for most of us, we are here, and we too are playing a large and important role in making Christ known to the nations. So everything you do is important. So do it unto the glory of God. So my prayer is that we will be a people who minister and love one another and love our brother and love our neighbor and do all these things unto Christ as priests who are mediating God's glory to the nations. Let's pray. Uh, Father, we thank you that um, you have changed us radically that now the things that used to be mundane, you have set aside now to be important, to be sacred. Help us to realize that all we do speaks to your glory, to the nations. So let us do these things faithfully. And Father, let us encourage one another, as this is often hard to do sometimes. We fight with sin. We struggle with grief and tragedy. And oftentimes we want to give up. 
But let us be quick to encourage one another and quick to love one another and bear with one another and hold one another up so that we can, as a community of believers, a community of priests, manifest your glory to the nations. In Christ's name we pray. Amen.